Um, joining me are Teresa Sokol, our state epidemiologist, and Dr. Catherine O'Neill, our chief medical officer of Our Lady of the Lake. Um, I want to do, before I turn it over to them for this briefing, a bit of housekeeping. Um, one, this briefing is on the record. Um, it is also being recorded now, so it will be made available to all of you. Um, we will also share it via press release after this briefing. Um, please do, um, if you are not speaking, mute your device. Um, if not, we'll, we'll have to do it um, for you, so, so thank you in advance. Um, also, we're really thankful for everybody who joined us um, with such short notice, <clears throat> really um, good attendance. Um, but a reminder that this is a technical briefing for the media, so we will, will be prioritizing questions from them. Um, and so if you could, as my, my um, colleague Kevin Litton mentioned via chat, as you have a question, please drop it into the chat. Uh, and please also include the name of your media outlet. Um, we, we get to the question and answer section of everything. Um, my colleague Kevin will be fielding those um, and directing those to Teresa and Dr. O'Neill. And so with that, I will turn it over to Teresa. Hi, thanks, Allie. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for in, uh, for joining today. We think that um, this is an important opportunity for us to share some information about this very rapidly evolving situation. And, and specifically, um, we want to talk a little bit about um, Omicron, the Omicron variant, and um, what's happening with that variant here in Louisiana. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit and sharing a little bit of data about that. I know that we had previously been reporting information about case counts. Um, we've now gotten to the point where the volume of Omicron cases has increased to where we really do need to uh, reporting the proportion of this variant that is circulating in Louisiana. So I'm going to share some updated information along those lines with you. Um, I will say this, if Omicron is not already the dominant circulating strain circulating in Louisiana. Um, we feel that it will be very soon. Um, you may be uh, familiar with the fact that we reported that as of the, for the week ending December 4th, um, we estimated that 4% of the circulating COVID, COVID lineages were Omicron. Um, we have looked preliminarily at the next week, which would be the week ending December 11th. And it looks like um, our estimate for that, the proportion, the Omicron proportion for that week is up to about 30%. Now, I will say this, the sequencing data that we have, they're not entirely representative because they do include outbreak samples that are sequenced. But considering Omicron's growth advantage, I, I feel confident saying that this, especially at this time, um, is probably fairly reflective of our current Omicron proportion. And again, if it's not already, it really will not be long before it becomes our dominant strain. Uh, <clears throat> so as it relates to that, I want to talk about what's happening with our COVID transmission overall. Um, unfortunately, it's starting to take a turn that we don't like to see. We're seeing a sharp increase in COVID cases. And most recently, we're starting to see an uptick in COVID hospitalizations. I can tell you that our seven-day average incidence, so these are the new cases per capita, it increased 60% um, this week compared to last week. Our uh, percent positivity, which you all know we usually report on Wednesdays, um, I did ask my team to pull that information preliminarily a little bit early just so we could see what was happening. And already it looks like it has jumped just over 1%. Last Wednesday we reported 2.2%. And as of today, the more data will be coming, but as of today, what we have, it looks to be about 3.3%. And that is in the context of increasing testing. So what we know about percent positivity, um, what we have all learned, is that if you're seeing increasing percent positivity in the context of large increases in test volume, then that further shows you that it's really related to transmission. Um, so it's a, that's another sign that, that we need to be concerned about what's happening. Um, 
everybody's familiar with our community risk um, uh, categories that we use. We have four um, categories for community risk. We have low, moderate, substantial, and high. Substantial and high, obviously, are two highest categories in terms of risk for transmission. Um, I can tell you that two weeks ago, 35% of the parishes in Louisiana were either at substantial or high levels of community um, transmission risk. Last week, that jumped to 65%. And again, preliminary data that my team pulled just this morning shows that what we will be reporting on Wednesday will probably be that at least 75% of our parishes are at substantial or high levels of community transmission. If you look at the state as a whole, we are at a high transmission overall. Um, I do want to touch very, very briefly on hospitalizations because we're seeing um, a very recent trend that is of, of great concern um, to all of us. And that is that um, four days ago, we reported that the number of people who were hospitalized with COVID-19 was 207. The next day it was 226. The next day it was 241. That's the number that is reported today because we report the prior day's numbers. And I can tell you that the number of inpatients, the number of um, patients that are hospitalized with COVID today, which will be reported tomorrow, is up to 265. So we're seeing over the past uh, four days fairly substantial jumps each and every day. So because of all of this, um, we really wanted to put some information out there, um, especially in light of the holiday season as people will be traveling and will be gathering with family members. We want to make sure everybody knows the best way to protect themselves and those around them. Um, you know, one of our ongoing messages of, of great importance is about the vaccine. We want people to get vaccinated if they're eligible, they get boosted as soon as possible. So the um, National Institute of Health recently released some data that confirms that the existing vaccines that we have work, uh, work against Omicron and, and most especially against the severe health outcomes from COVID. And the boosters that we have really strengthen and broaden this protection to a large extent. And that is one of the reasons that um, that is so important for people who are fully vaccinated and who might have just been sort of putting off getting their booster dose maybe until things calm down after the holiday season. Well, what we really want to do is to have people prioritize getting that booster, to go ahead and get that as soon as possible because it's going to be more and more important as more and more Omicron is circulating in Louisiana. Um, not being vaccinated leaves people unprotected against these severe outcomes. That's been our message from the beginning and it continues to, to, to be that way. Um, so as a, you know, just to sort of highlight that, the most recent data that CDC reports, and this is for the month of October, unvaccinated people are 10 times more likely to test positive for COVID than, uh, than um, fully vaccinated people. And they're 20 times more likely to die from COVID than fully vaccinated people. Um, just a little bit of, um, you know, logistical information. COVID-19s are widely available at more than 1,000 locations um, throughout Louisiana's 64 parishes. They're available at pharmacies, at hospitals, healthcare clinics, doctor's offices, um, you know, any place that's most convenient for folks, they're going to be able to find something, uh, a vaccine close to them. That you can find a list of locations um, that are, happen to be closest to you, um, and that would be at ldh.la.gov slash COVID vaccine. You can text your zip to um, get back, which is 438-829 in English. If you want that information in Spanish, text to vacuna, and that's 822-862, and you'll get the information in Spanish. Um, of course, we have our in-state COVID vaccine hotline. If you want to speak to a medical professional or if someone needs help in scheduling their appointment and can't utilize those other sources, we really want to be able to help them make that appointment. They can call 211 or our hotline at 855-453-0774. Um, the other um, piece that's going to be important um, especially in the context of Omicron, is regardless of vaccination status, 
We want people to get tested multiple times. And if we're thinking about the holiday season and about traveling and gathering with family members, we want folks to be tested um, before traveling, before gathering, and again, when you return. Remember that COVID tests really are just a, snot, a snapshot in time. Um, just because you test negative before a flight doesn't mean you're still going to be negative two days later when you go to gather at your family member's house. Um, there are COVID test sites all over the state. There are rapid tests that are available. Again, you can call 211 um, to find a testing location near you. And um, just FYI, the community-based testing sites will be closed Christmas Eve day, Christmas day, New Year's Eve day, and New Year's day. And these are just the community-based testing sites um, operated by, um, by the state. Um, but you can also find at-home rapid tests at local pharmacies, and they're even online available for purchase as well. The other important piece that I want to talk about is masking. So folks may be familiar with CDC's um, recommendations for masking. CDC recommends that everyone, regardless of vaccination status, mask when they are in indoor public places in areas of high or substantial community transmission. Anyone who is unvaccinated, who is over the age of two, um, should mask in indoor public settings regardless of transmission. Um, keep in mind that what I said, at least 75% of our parishes, and really what I'm, I'm, I'm getting at is pretty much our entire state is at one of these two highest levels of transmission. Um, so really where we need to be right now is that everyone, you're fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, boosted, or completely unvaccinated, we need to be masking um, in indoor public settings. In addition to that, um, if you're gathering with members outside of your household um, for a holiday gathering, especially, um, then you need to really be cognizant, be thinking about um, the risk of the other individuals that you may be gathering with. And if there are going to be individuals present that are at high risk for severe health outcomes, older people or folks with underlying health conditions, then it's a good idea to go ahead and mask in indoor private settings to protect those individuals as well. Um, <clears throat> the other piece related to um, gatherings is that, you know, I'm hearing from a lot of folks that the weather forecast is expect expected to be especially moderate on Christmas Day, which means that we can all take advantage of gathering outside. It's going to be the safest way for folks across households to gather. We recommend keeping those gatherings as small as possible at this point. We really are um, at high risk for another surge. So we really need to utilize all of these measures, vaccination, especially boosters, um, masking, and, um, <clears throat> and keeping our gatherings small um, to really try to prevent another surge the way some of the other um, locations that have uh, had a lot of Omicron are seeing and then what we saw with the Delta surge as well. So I'll stop there, Allie. I don't know if we're Lisa? passing it over to Dr. O'Neill next. Yes, thanks, Teresa. And next, I'll turn it over to Dr. O'Neill. Thank you so much, Allie. And thank you, Teresa, for that overview of where we are. Uh, Today in, in the hospital and amongst our healthcare providers, we also did a reset, looking at the same numbers that Teresa just gave to everybody and looking at our trends, which I, I think are just so informative for us. Every once in a while, we have a bad day. We have a bad case count, or we have a day where we think we're, you know, is this, is this gonna be a trend? Did we admit too many patients last night? And then it fizzles out. And that is not what we've seen over the last week. We have seen what, what is now, just hardens your heart and that is the beginning of a surge. We've been through it so many times that it, it, the, the telltale signs are all there. 
we canceled cases today because patients called and said, I have COVID and I can't come in for my operation this week. We tested healthcare workers, healthcare workers called in over the weekend and we had trouble staffing our beds. All of those are telltale signs even before the numbers come out. And then we saw the numbers that just corroborate the fact that we're in the beginnings of a surge. And we know that Omicron is more transmissible. We've had trouble keeping our surges down in the past with a, with a strain that was less transmissible than this. And so from the hospital perspective, we're preparing, but as we've talked about before, we have trouble preparing without the community because we are not out there at these gatherings. We are not out there to help you test right before. We, we do need the community to take out their COVID playbook, just like we take out our COVID playbook in the hospital. So today we said, everybody's got a mask again, whether you're in a clinical area or whether you're in the billing department, it's time to mask again because we don't want you to get your office mate, cubicle mate sick. And there's so much COVID in the community right now that everybody has it. And what we're going to see are staff shortages and outages around the holidays, which is very difficult for a healthcare facility. We also don't want to see any of our team members get sick and have to be admitted. And so we're doing this for their health and also doing this to keep our doors open, which is going to be so important for the rest of the community as we see this surge occur. The other thing that we did was we went virtual with people who could go virtual. We're making all of those adjustments because that's those are things that we know are tried and true and help to keep people healthy. So on the other side of that, what are we going to all do when we go home? What, what's our advice for healthcare workers? And it's exactly what Teresa said. Our playbook for our house is test before you go somewhere. Make sure you mask. Make sure you test when you get back. And make sure that you're contact tracing if you've been exposed because that's so important to stop the spread. When we looked at masking, it's it's very much akin to just being a good neighbor. You know, your mask does prevent you from getting COVID to some degree. It really and truly prevents all of these people who are, are so fragile. So my plans over the holidays, just in case anybody's wondering, I'm hoping to see some family um, and much of our family are older. Many of them are immunocompromised and I know that their vaccines don't work as well as I hope that my vaccine has worked for me. And so that means that we have to protect them we are vaccinated family and that's great but we're going to make sure that everybody who visits them are vaccinated and that they're masked because that's how we prevent the spread but the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to go to fun things i really hope to watch my nephew's basketball game in lafayette there's a great tournament i enjoy screaming really loud at basketball games because that's what my dad does too and and we wanted to do that together we haven't done anything like that in so many years but i'm already thinking about do i need to not go no i think i'm gonna go Am I gonna pick where I'm gonna sit a little bit better? Yes. Am I gonna wear a mask while I'm there? Absolutely, because I can scream through a mask and I'm going to be protecting the people around me and I'm going to be protected with my mask. And so just adding those layers makes us all safer. If we all did that as a community over the next two weeks, I, I, I can tell you what's gonna happen, but you know, because each time we've added masks, our rates have started to fall again. So we know that if we all take out our COVID playbook together, that we can help to at least dampen the surge. I, I think it's coming um, and our community has to prepare for it, but how high it gets, how painful this gets for all of our families, um, it depends on on our community. And um, and as, a, as healthcare workers, we can try to stay as safe and as healthy as possible to be there at the door of the hospital when they wheel anybody in, whether it's a stroke, a heart attack, a broken bone, or COVID. But um, but what we would like is to see less COVID patients and just take care of the people who really need us, and that requires the community's help. I will tell you that um, 2020, 2020, it was very difficult because each death is difficult and each admission is difficult and each counseling session with families are difficult but it is horrifying to sit with a family who just visited together 10 days before at a thanksgiving or a christmas and chose to go there and there's always somebody in the room who knew that they were the positive person at that gathering and then everybody got it and we're meeting around somebody's bed in the hospital um, and we have ways to prevent that now so 2020 was terrible and now we have all the tools to keep that from happening. So how do you keep your family from meeting in the hospital 10 days after Christmas? You test before you go. If you're leaving several days in advance, you test again. You test after you leave so that you can do contact tracing and you get vaccinated or you get boosted today if you're already vaccinated. 
And last, one of the things that we are going to struggle with as a hospital system is treating our Omicron patients. And that's one of the things that made us so concerned today. So we are hearing more and more data that we don't have good monoclonal antibody treatment for Omicron. We have good antibody treatment for Delta and we've been using it, but um, we have less choices. So for those people who are willing to take these risks, um, as a healthcare community, we have less tools in our toolbox to treat people. And because of that, it's so much more important to use the playbook that we're giving everybody just to keep people safe. So thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of uh, healthcare providers, Teresa, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you, Teresa. Um, and at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin who will field questions. As a reminder, please do drop your questions into the chat, include your media outlet name, um, or we, we won't call on you. So with that, I turn it over to you, Kevin. Hey, thanks so much, Allie. Uh, we actually have one hospital question, so I wanna just go to um, Dr. O'Neill first. What is flu looking like in the hospitals right now? Depends on the hospital and um, it depends on the day. So we've seen an uptick in flu overall. Um, still, our rates are, are not um, what you would describe as kind of being in the midst of a bad flu epidemic so far, but that, that number trickles up each week. And so again, that masking will help like we saw in 2020. Uh, a combination of respiratory viruses all at once makes COVID even harder to take care of. I know our Lafayette Hospital complained today of how many patients they have, not just with COVID, but with other respiratory illnesses, and those are hard illnesses to take care of. So flu is looking okay for this time of year, but we're definitely seeing an uptick. Very important to get vaccinated. We do know that the vaccine, we're hearing some information that it's not a perfect match, but it's better than nothing. And, um, and masking obviously will help keep flu down as we've seen in the last two years. And Teresa, can you speak on flu at a statewide level? Yeah, it, it's actually pretty similar to what Dr. O'Neill said. We have over the past several weeks been seeing sort of in, incremental increases. Um, <clears throat> I will say this, we are still below the regional baseline, which means you know we haven't really reached what we would consider to be a high level of activity, but we are seeing increasing activity each week and I expect that that will continue. The wonderful thing about masking is that, as Dr. O'Neill mentioned, it prevents, it can help prevent all respiratory, pretty much all respiratory viruses, right? So we see other respiratory viruses that are currently circulating. And so this can really help protect us, not just against COVID, but against a lot of other pathogens that, that are transmitted in the same way. Um, what we have seen in the past are flu outbreaks related to schools. The, the two settings where we see the most um, frequent flu outbreaks are schools and nursing homes. And so, you know, especially if we can mask in these settings, um, then that's going to really help prevent a lot of transmission that we see. So, um, again, masking and vaccination are really going to help us with flu and other respiratory viruses in addition to COVID. We also had a question um, about the advice that we've been giving the governor. The specific question was, have we advised the governor to give us a mask mandate? Uh, we know that comes out of his office, but what advice has have we looked at generally in speaking to the governor? So pretty much the, the same advice that, that we have discussed here, um, the importance of really making a public health recommendation to all individuals in Louisiana over the age of two, regardless of vaccination status, that now is the time to start masking universally in indoor public spaces. That's the way we're going to um, really curb transmission. You know, when Delta, when we first started to see the Delta surge, you know, one of the things that I always said was that um, your vaccination is what's going to end this pandemic for us but masking is what can stop a surge. So if everybody masks, we really can help keep the cases that we're starting to see and what we've seen in other areas, such as South Africa, where at first again was a very dramatic, very sharp increase in cases. And if we wanna stop that, the way to do it right now is for everybody to start masking. And that's gonna be the quickest way to stop this surge. Do we have any advice, Teresa, on uh, going back to school once everybody gets done with the holidays? You know, I think that we are carefully monitoring the data. I know that school systems and the Department of Education do the same thing. Um, I think that 
without a doubt. And CDC has always recommended and LDH has always recommended, um, which is a little bit separate, you know, as we kind of discussed from the, the governor's mandate, universal masking in K through 12 settings. Um, we think it's an important, very important for preventing transmission in those areas. And I think in addition to con the continued recommendation for masking of everyone, teachers, students, visitors, you know, staff, um, in addition to that, I think that entry screening upon return to school is going to be a very important tool. We saw that utilized at the beginning of the, the fall semester, and I think utilizing that same tool at the beginning of the spring semester is going to be equally important in, in trying to reduce transmission. Great. I'm just going to read this one from Shalina because it's so long. Thank you, Shalina, for your insightful question. But encouraging vaccinations is obviously the number one strategy, but isn't it kind of late at this point? How much of a help is it going to have with the holiday season? And what are we going to do to move the needle? Is masking guidance going to embolden groups that might be interested in misinformation? Um, so I will say, um, I don't know that I can speak to what may or may not embolden the groups that are anti-vax. Maybe Allie has some insight into that. Um, but what I can tell you, as I mentioned before, is that masking is going to be important. And that's one of the reasons that it's so important when the, we're at the start of a surge is because it does for people who are not vaccinated. Would be wonderful them for them to go and get vaccinated now. Wonderful for people to get boosted now. But we also know that it takes a little bit of time for the body to develop that immune response. You mask, you go out, you start masking today. That's going to prevent transmission today. And so that's one of the reasons it's so important in a surge. The testing strategy to frequent testing, particularly when you know you're going to be traveling or gathering with other individuals is also really important. And we're lucky now that unlike, you know, 15 months ago, we have all of these different um, testing um, uh, mechanisms that are available to us, right? You can, you can bring rapid tests over the counter rapid tests with you, test yourself in your hotel room. You know, there, there are ways to, to keep people safer by using these tools. And I really encourage people to do that. I do that in my house as well. When my son was exposed, I tested him every single day um, just to make sure that his fully vaccinated um, babysitter was protected, right? And so that's how you stop transmission um, is, you know, by making the best choices and, and using every strategy that you have available to you. To, to identify cases early and then to appropriately quarantine and isolate folks. Allie, I think we have a question that I can't see. I'm happy to ask it. <clears throat> it's from Johnston. Um, and it says, I know LDH is tracking Omicron cases leading to hospitalizations. Have there been any yet? Is the state tracking infection in those who have received booster shots? If so, what does that data look like? And so, Teresa, I'm going to toss that over to you. Sure. So, um, what I will say is that um, we know, this is what we know about Omicron, and we are still learning. We know that Omicron is spreading faster than Delta. We know that now. That was a question at first. I think that's pretty clear. Um, we also know that um, it's more likely that people who are vaccinated against COVID or who have recovered from COVID um, could be infected or reinfected um, from Omicron, with Omicron, more so than with Delta. Um, so as it relates to boosters, what we know is that boosters dramatically increase the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, data released from Pfizer and Moderna show that there is a 25 times and 37 times respectively increased antibody response from the booster um, after someone receives the booster against Omicron. So while there may be some decreased effectiveness against infection, 
um, the booster works well to boost that effectiveness against infection of symptomatic disease. But even the primary series is still highly effective at preventing severe disease, at preventing hospitalization and death. Um, so we are trying to track hospitalization. Um, when we were conducting case-based surveillance, we did not identify any hospitalizations um, that were related to Omicron. Because the volume is increasing, as I said, we're going to have to shift away from case-based surveillance. And as the proportion increases, as it becomes a dominant strain, then just tracking hospitalizations will be our way of tracking Omicron hospitalizations because they'll be responsible for the vast majority of our cases. What we are trying to do right now is conduct enhanced surveillance in nursing homes um, because what we want to do is to be able to identify when Omicron sort of moves. And keep in mind that most of the cases and most of the transmission related to Omicron that we've identified thus far have really been among young adults. And those folks are, are tend to not have uh, the experience of severe health outcomes as a whole anyway, um, at least not to the extent that older individuals or individuals with other underlying health conditions would. So what we're trying to do is really um, have good visibility on what that risk from, um, from Omicron may be when it moves into more into those populations, such as the nursing home residents. So we are conducting enhanced surveillance in those populations so that we can have a better idea really about that very thing. Um, we certainly have identified um, Omicron cases among people that have um, received the booster dose, but by far those are not the majority of the Omicron cases that we have seen. Thank you, Teresa. Um, there's a question about what do hospitalizations look like? I guess one is good for, um, so glad Dr. O'Neill is on the call. Um, Dr. O'Neill, is there any difference that you're seeing with Omicron in terms of the hospitalization? Right now we don't have day-to-day um, -day data on which one of our cases are Omicron or Delta, which is still a large percentage of the cases in Louisiana. And this uptick that we're having in hospitalizations is concerning for all of us because we, we don't know that that's Omicron. That may very well be Delta. And if it's Delta, that means that we're having another Delta surge, which we should have been vaccinated against. And, um, and that's concerning for those people who have not been vaccinated. So right now, if I look at our cases in the hospital, they look exactly like the summer. The people who are presenting with respiratory failure, they're people who are older, they're people who are either unvaccinated or have received one vaccine for some reason. We've, we've seen a couple of older people who maybe got one in the spring and that's it. And we don't have evidence that they got fully vaccinated and that's just not enough protection. So. What I see in the hospital today is something that should be totally preventable, and that's COVID. And it's just an unvaccinated person who has had multiple opportunities to catch up or to get vaccinated. And that's why we continue to, to go back to just go get vaccinated or get your booster if you are, because the, the sick people we're seeing have a preventable disease. They may have still gotten COVID, but they would not be in the hospital today if they had finished their vaccine series. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. So there's a question about, um, I guess this is a good one for Teresa. Teresa, can you give us kind of a sense of what the testing picture looks like? There's some reports about long lines at uh, testing sites, and then there's also maybe some shortages at the pharmacies with the rapid tests. So what can you tell us about the testing picture? Um, I've heard those same anecdotal reports. I don't have any um, data, any numbers to be able to quantify that. But we've heard those same anecdotal reports and what we've seen during previous surges, what we know already is test volume has increased um, fairly dramatically over the past couple of weeks. And in previous surges, what we've seen is increased demand for testing. So LDH is preparing for that um, by utilizing some federal resources to bring in um, some additional um, at-home tests and also to, to purchase at-home tests that we will be able to distribute to throughout the community. In addition to that, we are um, trying to mobilize some additional community-based testing sites. And specifically ones we know that, that, that folks really do like to get a quick answer. And so we're trying to offer the availability through some of these testing sites that we're gonna stand up in the near future um, that will hopefully be able to utilize those rapid tests 
and then also confirmatory PCR tests. But we do foresee the need for increased testing resources, and we are um, planning for that and working toward that as we speak. Great. Uh, there's only one other question left, which is more of a regional question. So Iman, we will get to you um, after this. Um, I'll just turn it back over to Ali to close out. Unless anybody has any more questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. But otherwise, I think we're through all the questions. Thanks, Kevin. And thank you again to Teresa and Dr. O'Neill. Um, and thank you to everybody who's joined us uh, for, again, this quickly pulled together technical briefing. We hope it was helpful. 